Good Friday morning, guys. I'm Jerry Miller, and this is Real Talk with Keith Smith. Thank you kindly for joining us. A show archived at realtalkwithkeithsmith.com, on ilovesebill.com, and wherever you get your podcasts. Today's program should be dynamite. Neil Williamson is in the house. He's the president of the Free Enterprise Forum, a man that covers local storylines as closely as anyone. In fact, you will often hear us on our many talk shows referencing Neil and looking for a potential perspective or answer from Neil and his big brain literally live on air. I think I did that a handful of times this week alone on the I Love Seville show. Also, when Neil comes on the program, people stop what they're doing and they listen. Um, and they watch and they ask questions because they know he's got institutional knowledge, institutional memory, and an institutional network. I think this is going to be Neil's cue to make a joke about being old, and then I'm going to say, no, 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 no. You're a tremendous resource of knowledge, my friend. Judah Wickhauer is going to welcome Neil Williamson to the program, and he's looking sharp. How are you? I am well, and it sounds like I should be institutionalized. <laughs> Neil Williamson. Pop culture jokes and, and, and um, one-liners will be plentiful on today's program. Dylan's Rule, thank you for sharing the show. We're very, very grateful for you. Um, we'll go straight to it. Where would you like to begin, my friend? Well, what, I think you have some news to share. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then we'll tie to the Free Enterprise Forum. So we touched on this briefly yesterday. Um, we'll spend more time on it today. Low High LLC um, purchased 915 East High Street, the old Martha Jefferson Hospital, from the CFA Institute for $21,900,000. CFA Institute, this is also very important, has agreed to lease back 47,000 square feet from the new owner, Low High LLC, for its ongoing operations. So the CFA Institute will stay committed to the city with its employees. It's a massive employer locally. Furthermore, um, Low High LLC, and Low High is a branding play on Locust Low and East High Street High, Low High. I initially thought it was Lower High yesterday. I have since been corrected. It's Locust and High, Low High. Um, they're going to open a co-working space and private executive office space, which is one of my businesses, in this location. Um, so you'll see co-working and private executive office space, plenty of parking at this spot as well. CFA bought this building in 2013, I believe, and they opened their headquarters in January 2014 after a massive renovation that was quite costly. So this is some pretty monumental news. Neil Williamson, first your thoughts on this news. Well, it... Um Again, you have to have a long memory to remember when Martha Jeff was downtown, but remembering the skeleton that was there, uh, the UVA Architecture School uh, actually did a case study on things that could be done with that building um, and recognized a number of environmental challenges. Buildings of that era have a great deal of asbestos that has to be dealt with. There was uh, runoff issues that needed to be, stormwater runoff issues that needed to be dealt with. Um, and I remember reading that report and thinking, this will be a costly revamp, regardless of whether they take all the suggestions or not. Um, in the end, the uh, CFA put in a lot of money and converted the building to a beautiful new space. Um, and now they're revamp they're they're selling portion of it because, frankly, they don't need it, um, and they're leasing back the other. Um, this is not that unusual, and it means that the uh, I, I'm never perfect on the rental market with regard to Class A, Class B, Class C. This is Class A. Right. So this is Class A office product. And we often see businesses that uh, may start in a somewhat, I know I worked for an ad agency like this. They started in somewhat opportunistic uh, business park that may or may not have had um, some shady stores nearby, um, but then moved up the chain to Class A office space. What does that do? It frees up lower class office space for either an additional business or the Free Enterprise Forum is suggesting some of that office space glut that is impacted by work from home, uh, not demands, but demands of the workers, um, may be prime for conversion to home ownership. Yeah, I, I can't wait to unpack this with you. This is an idea I, I, I've percolated with the Mac building, micro apartments on Market Street in downtown Charlottesville. So first, the CFA news. Um, reassuring to me that CFA is leasing back 47,000 square feet. 
um, shows they're committed to the area, although I think the point you made is very applicable, they see less a need for a massive real estate holding and the upkeep that comes with it. So they take a loss financially with this deal. I mean, they're losing money with what they purchased the building for and how much they put into the building and what they're selling it for or what they have sold it for. They're losing, them, losing money here. But in their mind, they're weighing the cost of the short-term loss versus what could be an even longer-term loss if they hold the building, continue need to, ma need to maintain it, and they're in a hybrid environment where they don't need space of this magnitude. Is that your read here? Well, I, I want to back up a step. Please. Um, CFA, what does that stand for? Um, tell me. Um, I, I should know this. I it's wanna... for Certified Financial Advisors. That's Certified Financial Advisors. Uh, and it's the CFA Institute. So these are folks that deal with accounting mm -hmm. and tax law. They may have looked at the numbers and seen an advantage to taking the loss at this point in their apex of business and take that loss and carry it for a couple of years, be able to write down some uh, income and it could be they come out ahead despite looking and paper on this particular deal of being behind. But I've never sat for one of the CFA exams, so I really can't speak directly to that issue. Uh, fair, fair. Chartered financial analyst. Much better, much better than what I came up Chartered with. Chartered financial analyst, the CFA acronym. Um, I respect what you just said here. Um, do you see, and go to Free Enterprise Forum. I'm going to share the link now. The top post on the Free Enterprise Forum is legitimately about prioritizing or seriously considering office conversion to residential. The headlines: the headline is Almaro's Goldilocks Housing Solution. Um, Open-ended on this post from you, Neil Williamson. Sure. Um, to steal a line from Robert Liberty. Oh, wait a minute. Um, uh, Silver Buckshot. Um, this is not going to solve Almaro's housing problem. We're probably talking about 100 or 200 units. But, and they may or may not be affordable, but they certainly would add to the supply. Um, think about, I, I, in thinking about this post, I think about Albemarle County and the office product inventory. There are some products that are shiny and new, and there are some products that probably could use a little facelift. Um, and generally speaking, if you're going to be making that investment, um, the question becomes, okay, when, what's the ROI? What's the return on that investment? And you could, what we're suggesting is Albemarle County could, with a minor uh, zoning text amendment, allow housing to be a use, residential housing, to be a use in things that are zoned for office. Now, the, the uh, city of Boston last week announced they're not just allowing it, they're incentivizing it. Uh, they're putting money behind this idea. They need housing badly in Boston. My daughter lives in Boston. And so they are incentivizing it. Uh, it. It is a costly thing to do, but it's more costly in tall buildings. Now, I was talking to someone about this yesterday, and they brought up um, uh, an office complex. Again, we don't have a position on any specific part, but just for an example, Satcham Village, okay. across from Albemarle High School. Okay. Um, I think they have eight buildings there. Um, and they're of a certain age. They, they're nice. Um, my doctor's there. It's got a great office. Um, but the, uh, that would be one of, those build, one of those era buildings that could easily, one or two of them could convert to housing. They're three store, two stories. Um, and the problem with tall buildings is you don't get the windows and you don't get the plumbing and you have to put in kitchens. Well, with the shorter building, most of the time you have windows and you often have a single kitchen for each office. So if you break it down to office size, you may have larger apartments, but you could do it the same way you would do build the suit for any tenant. Um, I think you're familiar with that option of building the suit. Doing it right now. And, and it, it happens all the time. Yeah. And so if you could do it and not have to change the shell of the building, you've got the parking, all of these are going to be located in the development area, close to what we call efficient delivery of government services, schools, fire, police. And so there's, there's the opportunity there. Maybe 100, maybe 200 units, but a, a major landowner talked to me about this earlier this week and said, yeah, we could do it. It could work. I don't know that I'd get the same amount of money back, but it'd be better than having them sit fallow. 
Yeah, okay, and, and you know, I'll jump in here. It's something I've considered doing. The cost for me personally is put it out of my wheelhouse, but that's not to say a deeper or better capitalized owner could not do it. It's just when my current position with my holdings, I could not financially afford to convert the commercial units that I own to residential. The likelihood of this happening, what are headwinds that could impede this besides, well, first let's go down the Almore County Road. Um, talk to us about red tape and government and how it could potentially preclu preclude projects like this from happening. Well, let's say nothing changed okay. and Albemarle County didn't do what the Free Enterprise Forum said. Mm -hmm. Imagine that, if they would ever not do what the Free Enterprise Forum said. Um, the, uh, then you would have to go through a two-year rezoning process. So that would add hundreds of thousands of dollars as well as um, two years' time. The commercial market... I think, I'm not involved in it as intimately as you are, changes about every 18 to 24 months. For sure. And that means you're going through at least two, if not three, cycles of ups and downs, additions and subtractions, and economic booms and busts. Um, so I think the, uh, the concept of just allowing it provides the ability to just do it. You still would have to meet zoning code, the uh, building code, so that it would be safe for the residences. You'd be adding its smoke detectors and things. There are things you'd have to do. And it may be that none of it could happen. But why are we as government standing in the way of it happening? That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, I've had an opportunity to interview some potential candidates for the board. Mike Pruitt came on the program earlier this week. I think Mike Pruitt would be all over this. TJ Fatally came on the program earlier this week. TJ Fatally straight up said he's not opposed to expanding the 5% developmental area in the comprehensive plan and believes it's time to do that. Pruitt said the same. So there's two. Um, Brad Reichel. Reichel. Remi rhymes like pickle. Reich Reichel. Rickle, I guess it yeah, is. Yeah, Rickle. Yeah. Um, I think would be in favor of this as well. Um, I do not think, and I'm not throwing shade on Brad, but I think he's got a, a buzzsaw that he's running against, and Ann Malik, who is seeking, as you indicated on the feed earlier this week, her fifth term. That would be a difficult one to win, but time will tell. Crazier things have happened. I think TJ and B. Lepisto currently in the Rivanna district very well could be a toss-up because of TJ's local ties to this community. Um, do we see the political capital maybe changing in Almoro as youth is looking to get on this board? Um, or do we think the political capital is still where it's, it's been for my 23 years of, of, of being in this community? And that political capital, I would say, is rigid and or resistance to new development and um, essentially big time change. Your thoughts? Um, well, since we haven't truly changed the development areas since the Carter administration, uh, to suggest that you're resistant to change might be an understatement. For sure. Um, that being said, I think that the, um, I commend the candidates who are running because contested elections means you're talking about ideas and explaining your position on ideas. I love contested elections. Nothing against the Scottsville candidate. I just would wish they had a contested election. I wish I knew somebody who was willing to run. Somebody. Would somebody please stand up and run? Somebody run for the seat here um, for the Scottsville district. Mike Pruitt currently running unopposed, so I think we can say he's going to be on the board. Um, contested elections do matter. Keep finishing your thought there. The, so the idea, what we've stated for over 10 years, is that, okay, we won't talk about expanding the development area. Let's talk about what it would look like, what the environment would look like when we could talk about the expanding the development area. Uh -huh. What about when the development area is full based upon 10 years of approvals by the Board of Supervisors for density? Oh, wait a minute, that's now. So I think that the time is right for a discussion of development area expansion. It's not going to happen. Um, it won't be in this iteration of the comprehensive plan, despite my best efforts to move forward the lasagna model, it doesn't seem to be catching on. Um, I, maybe I need to offer free breadsticks or something. But 
the lasagna model was to expand the development area and break it into two, mod two the, the uh, urban area, the suburban area, and then add a transitional area that would allow two acre lots with uh, well and septic. Um, that would be rather than the current rule of 21 acres in the development area. And right now, as someone else wisely said, and I can't remember whom, uh, the Albemarle community is not willing to embrace increased density and the Abmar community is not willing to embrace development area expansion, so there you are. There you are. Diantha McKeel said in the chair next to you, why am I going to expand the 5%? And I mentioned this to TJ Fatally. I mentioned this to uh, Mike Pruitt. She said, I'm not going to expand the 5% uh, uh, developmental area if we have so many vacant storefronts and shopping centers on Route 29. There's no what, reason to do what, it. What's the zoning on those? Um, the zone, zoning on those, tell, tell us, commercial? The, most of them are commercial or office. Yeah, so you're talking about here's an opportunity here. If you, one line in the zoning code, allow residential in things that are zoned commercial or, or, uh, or office. And we're seeing that with Seminole Square, although Seminole They had was, to go through a rezoning. Yeah, oh, they went through a rezoning. Okay, and that took forever. That, is that city? That is oh, in the city. That is the city right there. So Great Eastern Management um, is bringing a sizable um, portfolio of apartments to where Seminole Square is located. I actually had a client that considered um, opening a business in that shopping center, but the um, construction that's on the near horizon for that project, uh, the apartment conversion, prevented um, long-term lease potential. And there was some uh, ceiling height capacity issues as well. So we are looking at a different space. Um, how do you see the seminal conversion to apartments impacting things? Well, that's more of a build out rather than a conversion. They're not taking the existing buildings. They're taking a corner of that parcel and putting in, I believe it's five apartment buildings. That's right. Um, and the interesting thing is they, these are taller apartment buildings. Um, they are right on the transit line, and because of the topography, they're headed down toward the creek at that point. While they are taller buildings, they won't appear taller from the folks driving even on Hillsdale, let alone US 29, right. because of the change in topography. Mm. So that's important for approval purposes um, from local government. Do you think Charlotte, do you think Almoral County could be influenced at all by this? Um, what was uh, a shopping center being converted to apartment complexes? Because let's cut to the chase. If they can, I think this is a brilliant idea. You have really, 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 really good ideas, and that's why we follow you here. If we take empty shopping centers and make them apartments, and they're right next to where all the amenities are that people would need from apartments, you could potentially limit sprawl, you can limit um, wear and tear on roads and other infrastructure. You're keeping people where we wanted people to be anyway. But why isn't it happening now? Uh, because you know this as well as anyone, local government doesn't move quickly. And local government doesn't um, adapt to the free market, the free enterprise, like it should. I mean, it always seems to be behind the free market and capitalism and the speed that entrepreneurs and small business folks are operating within. And it's illegal right now. Well, it's illegal right now, but why, why not convert that? Why not make that little line change? I mean, what would keep them from doing it? I'm, I'm still looking for that answer. Yeah, that like, was the first question that I raised. Why wouldn't we do this? Why, you know, I mean, I would imagine Supervisor Galloway would be about this. He's a practical, common sense guy. Supervisor Andrews has is, is, is really surprised me, and I'm not throwing shade on Supervisor Andrews. He's doing a heck of a job. He seems to be very um, cognizant of the free market and the slow nature of government. I do not see, however, Supervisor McKeel or Supervisor Malik jumping on this right now. Uh, Supervisor Lapisto Kirtley is in an election year where she's in a tight race. I would imagine she's going to want to table this so it doesn't uh, impact potential votes come November. Um, I, I, I might suggest that I think she probably would be in favor of this based upon some information that I have, but I don't know for, for certain. She has to speak for herself. Right, sure, I'm totally. And we're just reading tea leaves based on previous votes. I cannot see McKeel or Malik saying yes to this. Um, I can see Supervisor Price saying yes to this. I think she would be all over it. We're working on lining up an interview now with Supervisor Price. Chip Boyle's jumping in with something. First, we want to say hi, Chip. You're missed around here. Um, he says the Seminole Square project is also following the hydraulic small area plan 
approved by both the city and the county. Chip would know a thing or two about these uh, at, things. At, I sat through a lot of meetings with Chip on that very topic. And um, yes, that's accurate. And the idea of having residential in a place that you can jump on the bus and go to work and then jump off the bus and be home, close to recreational facilities like the Rivanna Trail, is a, certainly an interesting idea. Uh, again, we don't take positions on projects, but it does fall in line with the H-250 study. Uh, well said. Um, Lonnie Murray, hello. Vanessa Parkhill, hello. Kevin Higgins, Olivia Branch, Meg Payne, Holly Foster, Lloyd Snook, Jamie Turner, James Watson, Woody Fincham, Mike Pruitt, Lauren and Keswick, Trevor Knight, Mark Glickman, Chad Wood, Johnny Ornalis, thank you for sharing the show. Jeff Fogel, hello. Dean Russell, hello. Katie Pearl, the list continues. A bunch of agents, a couple of developers, and some electeds watching you right now and some admins. John Blair, hello. Um, this is a no-brainer. This sounds like a great idea, and I'm glad you're championing this. I will also champion it on our network because if the shopping centers sit empty and they don't have tenants, then they're also losing Almoral County real tax, uh, re uh, retail tax revenue, meals tax revenue, um, any kind of taxes associated with tourism, visiting the county is gone. And to your point, why don't we get some kind of incremental tax revenue on the books as opposed to having these shopping centers sit empty because the commercial market and the commercial landscape has changed, deprioritizing retail storefronts, deprioritizing commercial office space because of a hybrid environment, allow the owners to pivot their models. That's what you're saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And, and one needs to only look at Albemarle County. Albemarle County was looking to, to uh, rent space for their uh, registrar. The registrar's office was growing. They didn't have space in the two buildings that they already owned, so they were going to rent additional space. Um, COVID hit. The uh, social services was one of the many groups that was sent home to work from home. They found social services, that whole department found, we work better remotely. They moved out of the office building, and the registrar is now in those offices. So there are the model is changing. The market always is changing. The question is, what will you do? Is it in your goals to provide housing, equity, and affordable housing to the community? Now, I can't guarantee all this would be affordable based on some of the costs, upfront costs, but more housing means less less costly housing. Yeah, Nicholas Serpe, welcome to the program. And it's important to emphasize this. I'm seeing people make this comment about um, Dairy Market and Dairy Central and how Dairy Market and Dairy Central and Chris Henry are expanding their footprint and adding more housing. And some people have said, this housing is not going to be affordable. It's at the 2,000 plus spectrum level. We have to realize this and, and perhaps some elected, I don't think Mayor Walker realized this, and I'm not trying to throw shade on her, but if you create housing at the top price point, what ends up happening is folks that can afford that price point gravitate to the shiny and new, and those folks that gravitate to this higher level are then opening up housing at the next level right below the shiny and new, and then that gets filled by people who want something nicer. And when they come up to that second slot, the third slot gets open, the fourth slot gets open, the fifth slot open. So as sexy and shiny and new comes on the market, that does have an impact at lower price points on the housing pyramid. You offer some perspective on this if you could. Sure, it sounds to me like you're, you're speaking in favor of the upzoning. I, this is, I'm torn on the upzoning. And I mentioned this to, who did I mention this to? TJ Fatally, or no, actually I mentioned this to Lloyd Snook on air. If the city of Charlottesville is upzoned, my holdings in the Macklin building become more valuable, unquestioned. And if the city of Charlottesville becomes upzoned, my house in Glenmore becomes more valuable. Right now, there is not a single unit for sale in Glenmore. There's not one unit for sale because people are sprinting to HOA neighborhoods to, to, because of the fact that the HOA is going to prevent density from happening there. So upzoning literally would drive value and wealth for what I have. What I'm torn on is this, if the city is upzoned and Peter Krebs made sure, wants to make sure that I use the word rezoning too, it's not just upzoning, it's also rezoning. Peter Krebs has said you should, and I think Peter's watching, tell all your guests it's not just upzoning, it's up, also rezoning. So we need to use both when we're talking. This is what I'm torn on. 
The developers I work alongside said, yeah, we're following this closely. If we upzone and rezone, then we're going to have more flexibility with the dirt that we buy, which means we can put more units on the dirt that we buy, which means that we can get more ROI on the units that we build on the dirt that we buy. But they've said to me, Jerry, be mindful that this dirt is going to be more opportunistic, so when we buy it, it's going to be more expensive. And when we buy it at a more expensive price point, we're doing at a time where the interest rate environment is expensive, the cost of goods environment is expensive, and we have a labor shortage where the folks working on our property are demanding the highest salary they ever have. So they're like, all these factors are going to work against affordability, but this is your opportunity to chime in so, more housing. So, yeah. so switch, if we could hit the rewind button. To yep. the, see, you we build it up here, yep. build it up here, and we free up all this space. So the reality that I see, based upon discussions with economists, is this is an evolution, not a revolution. For sure. And you're going to see projects come forward. There may be a, a stronger blip right at, up front of some uh, folks that have been waiting for it to happen, but then it's going to be less than 1% of the parcels annually. Um, that type of change is very, very acceptable. And I think that some of the most dramatic changes that have been proposed, uh, I've heard Mayor Snook on your program as well as others say, you know, we're not doing the 100% affordability. Uh, Brian Pinkston said it point blank in a city council planning commission work session, that's off the table. So the double density, 100% affordability is not going to be in the final draft that we see in a few weeks. So that is my understanding. So a lot of the highly concerning pieces. Now, the most recent uh, viral video with, uh, I love a vape shop in the middle of a neighborhood. I thought that was a great touch. Oh, it was a great touch. I'd, I'd love to drop that in the middle of Glenmore, see what Jerry has to say about that. But, you know, the... Um, we had to do a little scaring. We yeah, had to do a little scaring you know, with the video. Mom fear is a great fear. It, you know, we all recognize marketing when it's good, regardless of where it comes from. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Um, it is, it is a, um, an interesting <laughs> dynamic that folks that are clearly wanting to have some commercial, limited commercial, in their neighborhood so that they don't have a food desert, so that they can run out and get a dozen eggs, um, are not interested in having a vape shop. So how do you manage that? That's an interesting question. But it is possible to do through zoning. And I think that the powers that be have heard those cries and I think you're going to see some changes to that ordinance before it goes to public hearing. I think I 1,000% agree with you. Lord, uh, Mayor Snook pretty much referred to that, at least that he would be voting that way. And he mentioned that he has not, and, I, and I, Mayor Snook, I believe, is watching the show literally right now. Um, he indicated that he has heard from constituents and voters about that and how he would like to proceed, and he didn't want to speak for his fellow councilors, was exactly how you just described. Um, so they're listening to folks unpacked upzoning and rezoning. Peter, I listened to you as well. Peter Krebs, Piedmont Environmental Council. Um, what else is on the brain over there that you've been following? Well, the, with regard to that, I think the, the timing. I, I continue to believe, although I've already lost one bottle of bourbon, um, I continue to believe that the, uh, the rezoning, the upzoning rezoning will be voted on by the end of the year. I think you're right. Um, I believe they're going to have the PC. They've told me they're going to have a separate PC vote and city council vote or hearing, public hearing, separate public hearings, which is unique for Charlottesville. They like to do the joint public hearing. Um, and that means that it'll be strung out a little bit longer, but I think you'll get to the Planning Commission in September, October, and to the uh, City Council November, uh, December. But they'll have it resolved prior to the first of the year. But I'm not putting a bottle of bourbon on it because it was an expensive bottle. I think he, dude, you came through with the top shelf bottle. It's sitting on the bar over there. It looks like about about half is left. Is that what you're seeing, Judah? Wonder Judah where that other there. half went. Uh, you know. <laughs> where, where, I, where, somebody says J Dub. <laughs> maybe yes. Maybe no. Yes. Um, this question's come in the feed, and it's a good one, Grayson. Thank you for asking this question. Does upzoning and rezoning? and the city of Charlottesville influence Almaro County in any way? Grayson, that is a great question. Um, yes. Wow. It is a, we are one community. Um, what happens in Charlottesville has a ripple effect. Okay. So if we are able to increase housing affordability in Charlottesville, it helps housing affordability in Albemarle, just because of increased supply 
no longer do you have the folks running from the city to the county. Um, you, you see some folks staying put. So that does influence it. Um, as far as policies, I think that everyone is paying attention to what's going on in Charlottesville. Um, it's kind of a national model right now. And it is a, um, the, the consultant team, the, the, the million dollar consultant team is uh, on the third leg of this trifecta uh, where they did the affordable housing plan, the comp plan, and now the zoning code. And folks are looking at that as a model as well. If you're going to make these changes, how do you make them stick? You, you make them stick by changing the policies and then changing the zoning. Respect. Uh, Marlene Jones, hello. Bill McChesney, hello. Nicholas Erpe, hello. Johnny Ornalis from um, El Mariachi and Guadalajara just shared the show. Thank you, Johnny. Catherine Lochner, hello. John Dean, Kay Graves, hello. Jim McVeigh, hello. Questions for Neil Williamson, put them in the feed and I will relay them live on air. Lonnie Murray, I've, I've, I promised the rev share um, with Neil Williamson. So let's start open-ended on this. This has come up with the mayor. It's come up with Mike Pruitt, and it's come up with TJ Fatally. Revenue sharing agreement, Charlottesville and Almoral County, open-ended at first, anywhere you want to go on that. The revenue sharing agreement is a contract, and it is a contract between two localities. It was approved by referendum by both localities, and would, in order to make any changes, it would require a referendum by both localities. Um, there have been efforts over the years to get the state involved, and the state said, you signed a contract. We are not party to that contract. We don't want to be a part of that contract. Folks tell me, well, a year after you signed the contract, the state said they forbid annexation. Well, actually, they prohibited it for a short time, and that's been renewed a number of times. Um, the thing that people forget is that annexation, people say, well, this revenue sharing, it's forever. Well, so was annexation. It, it was forever. We should set the stage on what was happening. This is 1982 here. Set the stage of what was happening then. Where were you in 82, Jerry? I was um, in 1982. I was learning to crawl. I had no teeth. I was uh, drooling all over my face. There was probably pee in my diaper. And I was making life for my mom and dad, small business owners, literally a living hell. Well, I was, I think so I was many things six haven't months changed. So, um. <laughs> no, my mom used to always say this. It's so funny that you brought this up, and then I'll get out of your way. I was a very challenging child. And, and, and that's probably an understatement. There here. are probably a number of viewers that are I, very surprised by I, that. I think the viewers and listeners know this. J-Dubs smiles knowingly. J-Dubs knows this. It was oftentimes, Jerry, you're going to military school. That conversation was on the regular. Very challenging. And I remember my mom distinctly saying when she was angry with me, and my, mom and I have a fantastic relationship. I don't want you to think otherwise. But she would say, you are going to get what you are. Just wait. And now our oldest, who's five, Literally, it's like looking in the mirror. Wakes up at 5.45, 6 in the morning, sprints into our bed, is jumping on the bed saying, what are we doing now? Goes to bed at 9.30 p.m. at night, does not need sleep, is 1,000 miles an hour at all times, and is relentless. Um, so a little background here. Set the stage, 1982, Charlottesville City is maybe threatening, maybe leveraging, maybe playing the game that it's going to annex some of Almoral County. There were maps. There were maps, and there was a great, um, if you go online to freeenterpriseforum.wordpress.com and click on the reports button, you can uh, see the uh, hindsight report, which kind of lays it all out. Uh, we wrote this a couple of years ago because this discussion just kept coming up over and over again. And what we did is we worked with uh, uh, Derek Burdoff, who used to work for the county, um, and did a GIS study of the tax revenues that it came from that very map. What the city was planning to do was annex a lot of the commercial space that you see uh, north, uh, really about where Stonefield is and uh, where the post office is and beyond, all of that space to um, capture that commercial revenue and remembering commercial, reven commercial tax revenue comes with fewer costs. So the, um, there are some residences in this space and Diantha McKeel when she read the report mentioned you didn't calculate that out and I agree that's a fair criticism but the reality is the vast majority was well designed and very much a drawing a gerrymandered map to capture commercial revenue um, and they had the power to do so um, and they could say we will serve this part of the county better than the county will they and they would go and, and file for annexation and 
90% of the, I think over 90% of the annexations were approved in those days. This was, uh, so this group of um, five C's, the Citizens Committee for City County Cooperation. Wow, I can't remember, I still remember that. Five C's, that's impressive. Um, the, uh, led by uh, Lee Middleditch back in the day, um, came up with this idea of revenue sharing. Okay. And revenue sharing can go both ways, but it was an idea of capturing the, uh, the values and, and creating a symbiotic relationship for shared products, shared projects, because we are one community. For sure. So the idea being, you know, we could unify our fire departments and we could share the costs of that. Those types of things or a specific capital improvement. Um, in the end, this went to referendum and then to a uh, public hearing. Uh, the first person to speak at the public hearing called out the fact that the revenue sharing agreement calculates the taxes based upon the taxes on the books, not based upon the taxes collected. So if you're in land use taxation, um, where you're in agricultural use and you receive land use taxation, which is a reduction of your tax bill, the revenue sharing agreement ignores that reduction and says you pay based upon, not you, but the city, the county pays based upon that value that's on the tax rolls. Okay. And the first person in the public hearing said, this is a loophole that you guys need to close. This is bad. This is a bad deal. And quite frankly, I'm told by people that were in the room in these probably smoke-filled rooms back in the day, yeah. um, that that was discussed and that was one of those things they gave away because in order to get something else. So um, it was a negotiated contract. It has been a campaign issue for as long as Jerry's been alive. Um, and it is, um, uh, uh, to hear Lloyd Snook say it, they, they were working on it behind the scenes um, prior to him getting on the Planning Commission. And I do believe that was about the same time Jerry was born. That, you're 100% right. Lloyd said that yesterday. Um, Donna Price um, joined us here in this discussion, if you could, please. Um, and anyone watching the program, please do. Why do we have this? Why do we have folks on the Almoro County side that are pro Almoro County say this is a terrible agreement? And then we have folks on the Charlottesville side that are pro Charlottesville say that this is a terrible agreement. Is that a sign that this was a really good agreement and that folks are on the both sides are itching to itch this, you know, tear this up? Well, I, I would suggest everyone should read the hindsight report okay. um, and give me money. Uh, but free Enterprise Forum. Freeenterpriseforum.wordpress.com. Click on the reports button. Look for the hindsight report. That report really lays it out line by line, year by year. And it, it shows that, quite frankly, it was a pretty okay deal. Um, and, you know, it hasn't been updated. I haven't gone back and redone the data. But it, it shows 25 years, I think, of, of work, uh, of existence of the, of the deal. We're so, talking like $15 million here a year, right, roughly? Uh, it goes up and down. Okay. The other thing that's interesting about the revenue sharing agreement, and I love this part, yeah. it looks backwards two years. Okay. So what you pay this year is based on two years ago taxes. Okay. So, so this year's pay is going to be based on COVID economic ecosystem. Exactly. Exactly. So there have been years where I think it's been eleven uh -huh. million dollars, and that, and then years it's been nineteen, I believe. But um, uh, Mayor Snook mentioned the idea that forty-four percent of their revenue in the city is from housing. I would beg to differ, because. All of the money, of, of a large portion of the money that comes from Albemarle County comes from a housing tax. It's just not from Charlottesville. So all that revenue sharing money should be counted as money that comes from residential taxation, be it from Albemarle County, not the city of Charlottesville. There you go. Neil Williamson dropping dimes today. John Blair says on LinkedIn, you're on absolute fire. Does this agreement ever get torn up? Or is this agreement, it's got, what, 18... 31, was it 41 years of, of long in the tooth? 41 years of life? Is this the agreement we got going forward long time? Past performance does not guarantee future performance. Right. But I would be surprised if this agreement gets renegotiated prior to my retiring from uh, this job. And I've got at least another 20 years left. Oh, minimum. Minimum. 20 years left. Neil Williamson, you're living to 120, which means retirement is at 100, and you're 45 years old. So this guy's got significant time left. 
what could lead to it getting torn up? Is it, would we need to have majority vote on the Board of Supervisors and then majority vote on City Council to even consider this? It a would, renegotiation? It would require uh, a majority at the beginning of their terms to do that. Now remember, that's counting to four in the county because we have a six member council uh, board uh, and a majority in the city. And then those would have to probably win their reelection to get it to a referendum. And then it would have require a referendum for, on the part of the city residents and the county All right, to so endorse it. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Well, you know, I, I mean. So you basically are saying we would need on the Board of Supervisors four of six, and those four of six need to win one term, and those four of six then need to get reelected again for a second term, or people that vote like the four of six would have to be reelected to keep the momentum going, and we would need three of five on city council to be in favor of it over a four-year term and then either get reelected for another term and or have folks that are in the same mindset as them and we would need a voting referendum in both the county and city that has majority saying yes to this that's a lot of headwinds off the stone guy nothing but net yeah <laughs> Neil Williamson, I, I love this guy um what, what do you say to the folks that say this deal was done in an uh, extortion uh, type of setting? Because that's been put on the feed, which I've seen. I know you've seen that comment. Um, any deal that's made, any deal that's made, is built with compromise in order to get the deal done and leverage. And whatever leverage you have may or may not be there even the next day. So you can't understand the decision without understanding the position, the parties that were in favor of this and signed the deal um, were in. Basically saying that the county had no choice. Uh, I the county was fearful that it was gonna lose one of its primary tax revenue corridors and it had no choice. How would you feel if annexation was still a possibility? Would you still feel the same way that the county had no choice or that the county made a good deal to take annexation off the table? Yeah, 100%. I see what you're saying right there. And, and we can utilize the same logic with uh, Rivanna Station, the spy, uh, the, 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 you know, Rivanna hundreds Station, of Rivanna Station. Futures. Yeah. Rivanna, yeah, the hundreds of acres purchased um, Almaro County under contract or verbal contract. Where are we at with that? How do you care? It's this? under contract. Yeah. But it's in due diligence. And due it is diligence. not sell, settled yet. Yeah. A lot of folks have beef that maybe the county overpaid for, uh, for this parcel of land from the Wood family. But using the same logic we're using with the revenue sharing agreement, how would we feel if this epicenter of economic um, stimulus went to St. Louis? We would say, good God, the county screwed up here. I mean, it's same logic. Same logic, but let me give you just a little bit. You love these tidbits. I do. I a do. tidbit on the financing for that deal. Okay. The way the next five years of that deal is going to be financed, if it settles, uh -huh. is interest only, $5.1 million, and there's already that money set aside in the budget okay. for economic development. Okay. Do you believe this qualifies as an economic development project? I do. And so... I do. That, that buys them five years to shop out the bond okay. and figure out the financing for how all of it works. Uh -huh. And I think it shows great uh, vision. I know that they are now, you know, you can't do some things when the deal's kind of cooking. I know they are talking to Virginia EDA and, and trying to find additional funding sources that couldn't be done until you had a deal. Um, people are like, why didn't they go to them first? Well, because I didn't have a deal. Yeah. It's a chicken and egg thing. Yeah. So, so five years, no, five years we're making interest only payments. That's the plan right now. Uh, to the tune of 5.1 million. It's my memory serves. Yes. Okay. And in that five year period of time, this is what you are anticipating that either the deal will get additional funding from third parties, which alleviates the tax burden on residents of Almore County. Or Almore County could do a joint venture of some capacity with a developer or a third party that has a vision for this acreage that can further the economic development um, vision for this parcel of land. Is that what you're saying? And or the interest rate environment may change for positive. Making the money more affordable. Right. And the debt service and carrying costs more affordable. Yes. 
I love that. That's good. That should have been out there. Uh, why well, was it, wasn't, it wasn't out there until three weeks ago when they had to discuss, because you have to do the deal yeah. before you discuss how you're going to finance the deal. I love, okay, Neil Williamson dropping more jewels here on the program. Um, the folks that say Wendell, the Wood family is sticking it to the county, I don't think you buy that. I certainly don't buy that. The guy's just doing a deal. Is that how you look at it? There's a contract between two entities, the county and the landowner. Yeah. The county was not kicking and screaming into the deal. Right. The landowner was not kicking and screaming into the deal. We don't take positions on projects, and we certainly don't take positions on contracts that are negotiated between two independent parties. I love it. I love it. That's a segue into East High Street. Wendell again in the news, this time for the land on Rivanna River and the floodplain. He's got a joint venture deal in purgatory with Bo Carrington, a developer for this land on East High Street and 250 some apartments that are coming. Mayor Snook literally said yesterday on the microphone in your chair on our show that he's in favor of the city buying this land and keeping it or turning it into a park. I, I believe he said there's an ethical responsibility if we're going to preclude um, positive use of this land to buy it from there's the developer. an ethical responsibility to purchase it and then keep it as a, a park now again those were his words yes those and, were his words and he even said this i said you guys utilize and he's watching you guys utilize taxpayer money to get an appraisal on this parcel is that appraisal in he said yes and then i asked him what's the value and he said i'm not going to tell you would, would that be a logical no, thing no, to do I, I, in I, a negotiated position? I respect that he wasn't going to tell us. I, I, I love Mayor Snook. He knows I love him here. So your thoughts on this? My, my thoughts are that this is a parcel. There is a willing landowner. Uh -huh. There is a plan. They have still have some challenges with access, but there is a plan that could put 250 apartments on that parcel. And though that would be more housing. And we need housing. So... There are some that are opposed to it for transportation reasons. There are some that are opposed to it for environmental reasons. Um, there are some that just love the river and want that land that they don't own to remain exactly as it is, the way they don't own it. But <laughs> if you want to have it a certain way, buy it. Okay, I'm 100% with you on that, in agreement with you again. If the city buys this land, which I think this is where we're gonna head, and prioritizes it as a park. And Mayor Snook also made reference that because even though it's prioritized as a park, doesn't mean the park cannot be used for economic development purposes, okay? And we briefly talked about um, catering or appealing to restaurants and businesses that wanna overlook the Rivanna River. Hogwaller Brewing Company is opening in the old Pie Chest location. Wilson Ritchie and his team are gonna be doing something similar with a brewery on High Street. Does this not, how, how could this be utilized or leveraged or how could this transition into say like a building like the Dewberry, which I asked him as well. The Dewberry is a shell of, its, of what it's supposed to be. Now John Dewberry is paying the taxes on this and the city has no right to eminent domain it because we're not at the point of blight or we're not at the point of unsafe. And if Dewberry continues to pay his taxes in June and December on this parcel, the city really can't do anything. Should the city jump in and make an offer based on what it's doing on High Street with Wendell Wood and his family for John Dewberry in this hotel? Seems there's some synergies there, or at least they're in the same kind of conversation. They, they may be in the same conversation, but remember, it, it is, whether you like the individual or not, property owners have rights. And if John Dewberry chooses to do nothing with that parcel. Which he's doing and keep it safe and pay the taxes, he has every right to do so. I agree, I give you that. But if they're gonna jump in and make the Wood family an offer, isn't that the precedent to, that, the precedent to make Dewberry an offer? Because we're talking about arguably an even more um, concerning parcel of land, downtown mall. You're, you're making a judgment call. Oh, that's fair, and, that's fair, that's and fair. It would it would be, the, the concept is there for um, the, the city to do anything. They have money to do things. Yeah. Um, that being said, there's been a long talk about the Rivanna and why are we turning our back on the Rivanna River? And you know, my trip to Greenville showed me all the things that you can do with a river. 
right? I mean, it, it, it's something else. You've been there. You can do a lot with economic development and a city park in a river area. It does require funds, and it does require vision, and it takes a long time. It would seem there could be a lot you could do with a 10 or 12-story building right in the heart of downtown Charlottesville, though. It, I would agree. I, I, again, I, think, I don't believe it creates precedent. I, you don't think there's precedent with the Rivanna purchase from the woods if the city goes that way? You don't think that's precedent? I believe every acquisition uh -huh. should be judged independently Okay. because it, each one has different things going on. Peter Krebs would mention the floodway issues. Yeah. Um, and, and they're real. They can be engineered. It can be done. And it can provide housing. So if the city chooses to provide parkland over housing, that's a decision that should be discussed as well. Uh, Michael Payne, hello. Uh, we we, we got to get you back on the show. Councillor Payne. Dave Norris, hello. Thank you kindly for watching the program. We need to get you back on the show as well, Dave. Um, what do you guys think, viewers and listeners? What do you think here from Neil? Dropping jewels. Um, Jesse Rutherford, we love you, man. Bellamy Brown, hello. Chris Fairchild left this comment yesterday under Lloyd's under, in the comment section when Lloyd was on the air. I have to throw this to you. Um, Chris Fairchild said, and Chris Fairchild is the supervisor, one of the supervisors in Fluvanna County. He said, in the state of Virginia, recent studies showed that for every dollar in residential real estate taxes realized, $1.18 is the cost of community services burden. I suspect turning that property into apartments on the Rivanna River will not bring as much revenue as cost and will ultimately cost the citizens notably more than the loss of the tax revenue it could bring in. He says $1 um, for every dollar in residential real estate taxes realize the burden on infrastructure, schools, and other services the jurisdiction provides is a dollar and 18 cents. And he also was quick to say, then I'll stop, that on a side note, I am not no houses in Fluvanna County. We have by right where one could build everything from a single home to nearly one house per two acres on a larger property. By right would not require a special use permit and that's the right thing to do. He says, I have just not seen a high de density development in Fluvanna that I would be included to vote for. He's mentioning a special use permit right there. So anywhere you want to go on Fairchild. Um, first off, I appreciate the clarity of that comment. Um, so according to that study, and that's a statewide study uh, looking at all housing, that it, you're an 18 cent delta on the real estate taxes. What have we learned about retail and rooftops? Um, retail, and what do you answer? Retail that follows rooftops. Okay, absolutely. So absolutely. Absent rooftops, you don't have retail. I mean, look at Fluvanna County. Right. Yeah. So 90% plus of Fluvanna County's budget is funded by rooftop residential taxes. Right. And so where is the retail in Fluvanna County? Uh, City of Charlottesville, Almore County, or Zion's Crossroads, which is Louisa. Right. And also, right around the lake, there's a couple little nodes, like but they're line. small. Yeah. There's a food line, there's yeah. a Papa John's, there's a couple other things right outside the, the gates of the lake. Um, the, uh, I would push back on Chris's subject to say, take a look at the sales tax data that we put forth in the retail report and how much money each locality gets in sales tax and add that sales tax impact to the impact of housing. So you you may be getting a dollar eighteen or dollar for a dollar you're costing yourself eighteen cents, but because you have that rooftop, you're getting sales tax revenue. Now you may not have the retail establishments to support it. Well, that's because you don't have the rooftops. So again, statewide studies are great, but it is um, it is I believe it's true that especially when you're looking at units such as apartments, which are smaller units, that that and the return on that those are generally lumped into the commercial tax because it's owned by one owner or a company. Those are commercial tax revenue. Um, I believe that apartments do pay for themselves. They tend to have a significantly less impact on schools uh, than, uh, than single family residential, certainly. Um, and so I think that I, I would push back that dollar eighteen when it looks at apartments is definitely overstated. Um, you're getting props. Peyton Alley 
um, is, is said, Neil is the man. Peyton Alley has said that. Uh, Nora Gaffney is giving you props and says she would 100% go along with Neil's idea and thoughts on the river. Vanessa Parkhill in Earliesville's got some comments for you. She says, I wish the revenue sharing agreement would have included a sunset clause review period built into it. She also says, regarding the revenue sharing agreement, as an Almoral County taxpayer, I sometimes feel that I have no vote in how a portion of my tax dollars are spent because I have no say regarding representation on the city council who is directing how the proceeds of the revenue sharing agreement are spent. It's a fair comment. It's a fair comment. Uh, the sunset provision, if my grandmother had two wheels, she'd be a bicycle. <laughs> I'll steal that from you. You know what, Coward got a smirk out of that as well. Um, so, Rivanna River, I know you don't take a stance on this, but the tea leaves you're reading, the tea leaves I'm reading, we're seeing a potential park. How can the park be utilized as a economic development? And you've touched on this with Greenville already, but go a little deeper for economic development along High Street and the Rivanna River. Because I wanted to push back a little bit on uh, what Mayor Snook said. The High Street corridor and those neighborhoods, you got um, you know, a lot of wealth on the Locust Avenue side of High Street. A ton of wealth there. You got um, a very gentrifying neighborhood on the um, Hogwaller side of High Street. Uh, a neighborhood that was previously working class those ranchers are now trading for four, five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars. And why? Um, because of a limited housing stock and, and people wanting to live in the city and walk close to the epicenter of employment and enjoy the epicenter of employment or the amenities that downtown has to offer. And um, upzoning has throttled supply. Give us the and. And Rivanna Water and Sewer Authority uh -huh. spent eight hundred thousand to a million dollars in. To scrubbers to keep the smell, keep the from, smell being from being nasty in yeah. that that area right, right and that is really in the last 10 years and that literally that investment that was made by rwsa ha, is why willow tree is where it is is what one of the it would have been a reason not to locate there and is, is also driving value in that community um who suffered mightily for 20 years with issues with the treatment plan. Uh, he's 100% right. Um, neighbor of mine, Brian Roy, the developer behind the Wool Factory, um, and he's indicated as such. Those old school Charlottesville may remember this, new school Charlottesville may not. Um, the treatment plant made Hogwaller and parts of Belmont, I don't want to say uninhabitable because that wouldn't be fair to the residents that live there, but impacted quality of life with a stench that came from the treatment plant that was a stench synonymous with um, rhymes with hit feces. I would say feces. Okay, I, I got much more to the point than Neil. It, it smelled like S H I T. Okay, now that is not the case. So that neighborhood is is thriving. So economic development and a park and the river. What do you give us a take? I I believe that there's opportunities. Um, if you went to Greenville, you would find out that uh, they, similar to our mall, they did a downtown walkable, they do allow parking, diagonal parking, I believe it was, um, on both sides of the street. But in order to make it happen, they actually made the lobby of the, of the uh, hotel a city park. City employees maintained the lobby of the hotel. That's crazy talk. That's crazy. That's awesome. And when they were able to get out of that deal, they would leverage those funds in elsewhere. But the other thing that they did, and the mayor, who was mayor for 20 years plus, said the big kicker was we had people living downtown. You had to have people living downtown. It couldn't just be a place you go to visit. But has, has the political climate changed enough that government now wants people living downtown? In front of the program, Oliver Kutner tried to do micro apartments off of Water Street. Councillor Galvin, who I have a lot of respect for, Kathy Galvin, watches and listens to the show regularly. She, in a lot of ways, kiboshed the micro apartments that Oliver tried to bring. And now we have an office building that is not full where the micro apartments would have been anywhere you want to go. It, it seems as though the more government gets in the way of the market, 
the less they get it right. And I'm not speaking specifically of this project, but in general terms. I, I concur. I concur. Um, I got to get the Greene County news out. Greene County, um, two nights ago, the Planning Commission, right, Planning. they, they greenlit um, some pretty significant development. Now this is in hands of the Board of Supervisors of Greene County, and no one kneels, knows this more than Neil, who lives in Greene County, and talented field officer Brent Wilson, who often covers news for the Free Enterprise Forum. Big props to Brent Wilson, who I know from my sports and volleyball days. Well, you were great in volleyball. I thought those shorts were too tight, but um, the- uh, They're still too tight. <laughs> the, the Green County Planning Commission voted four to one in favor of a rezoning that would allow a mixed product, 500 units, and make, allow it to be mixed product. The one vote that was opposed um, had an issue with the fact that it did not include uh, recreational amenities uh, in the site, in the plan. Um, it's not required in the Green County Code. Um, the market will actually demand such things, but there are sidewalks, but not walking trails, not a tot lot. Um, so the developer at the, at the meeting said that that would likely be a part of it. Um, I d again, it's not required by code at the rezoning stage. Um, the buy right zoning for this is 500 single family residential. Um, again, not taking a position on the project. However, the, um, the mixed use or the mixed uh, proper, property types, it decreases the impact on the community. Single family residential produces more children than townhouses. Uh -huh. And children make go to school. Eventually your children will be going to school. Um, we cannot wait. Yes, I know. Dear they, Lord, please be tomorrow. Um, but. <laughs> 60%, 60 to 65% of every locality's budget in Virginia is education, K-12 education. So that's a huge impact. The reduction of that impact by switching products also is a reduction or an opportunity for housing affordability because attached product tends to be cheaper to deliver to the market than detached product. So... Do we think the political capital with the Board of Supervisors is there to green light what the Planning Commission has green lit already? It, the Planning Commission makes a recommendation to the Board. It was right. a 4-1 recommendation for approval. That's overwhelming. Um, sure. Um, the Board will make the decision. Right. Um, and the question becomes one of do you want to allow 500 units, single family units by right, or do you want to encourage this mix, this tapestry of product um, in a planned urban development so that you get these streets lined up right and all the rest of that kind of stuff? Um, that's a choice for the board. Uh, I don't know that I can make a prediction on that. Okay. But, but What's I your would, hunch say? My hunch says that there will be a split board, but I can't say 3-2-2-3. Three, two, two, three. I don't know. Okay. Um, I think we're both in agreement that either iteration, the inventory is going to sell well. You agree with that? In general, I would agree well, and I also will say I don't know for certain that because of topography and other challenges that the single-family residential you could, could get, even get 500, 500 on it. Yeah, I doubt you could. But if you couldn't, yeah. you would have to go down, I think it's, you'd have to reduce by 62 units in order to get to the same impact in schools as the attached product at 500. So it would be 438. Yeah, and, and I think you could get 438 on it. So it, it's making decisions about what you want your community to look like. For those who know the area, this is a, if you're driving toward the park, toward Shandoah National Park, there is a farm, the Sims Farm on your right, as you're headed toward the schools that has a, a lovely house on it in the middle of a big field and they just put up a new garage. But um, that parcel actually goes up into the town of Standardsville, and that would be the parcel that they're talking about. Um, and it would connect to the part of the town right on the, as you walk, go into the town on Business 33. So this could help the town? It definitely could help the town. Portions of it are walkable to Standardsville. Okay. Not all of it, portions of it. Okay. Um, and depends on who lives there, because you know Stephen Wright said, isn't everything walkable if you have enough time? What? That's true. What do we know about the developer? Um, I was not in attendance at the meeting. Okay. Um, and again, I don't take positions on projects. Sure. So I, I do know. I think uh, Justin Chimp was the engineer on the project. Justin um, Chimp. I, so. I believe so. I believe so. I read 
some files early on before the hearing, and, and I believe he was doing the, the engineering work. But the, um, the idea of providing different product than single family residential would also speak to Mr. Fairchild's idea of, well, if single family residential is producing statewide a dollar 18 in cost for every dollar it brings in, I'd love to see that number for attached product. Um, here's the next question. If this project's gonna materialize, right? This project will materialize either as single family detached housing or as mixed use product. What happens once, and you can't see into the future, but I'm hearing from a lot of your residents and, and, and some of the folks that we've had on the program, won't mention any names, that the resistance level to new housing is ticking to levels that folks have not seen in green. Are you feeling or seeing or hearing um, a similar friction mentality to housing around your neck of the woods? I, I think that's well put. Um, I think any time you have approved housing in the pipeline that you don't know what it, it's going to be. Uh, especially a project of this magnitude. Of this magnitude yeah. or of any other magnitude. Yeah. There's under, just under 2,000 units just south of 33 uh -huh. um, wow. that haven't come out of the ground yet. And the reality is many of them will come out of the ground, but it'll be what the market will bear. Um, one of the developments that was approved is only going to be providing 45 units annually. Um, until they get to their capacity. And that's a proffer that they've offered. Um, that's probably what the market would bear anyway. So, you know, when you're looking at these things, it doesn't mean they're all coming at once. The one thing government doesn't control, and this is true with Mr. Newberry, it's true with these projects, the timing of implementation. Right. The government can green light it. It doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. Right. Look at North Point. What year was North Point approved? 20 years ago? 1990, oh, I'm sorry, 2003. Okay, 20 years ago? 2003. Yeah. Um, if you drive north on 29, you'll see a, a sign for a part of North Point that said coming in 2009. Right. It's still there. Sure. Faded. Yeah. Financed by Blue Ridge Bank. Right. It's still there. It's faded, and it's, there's no project there. Yeah. There are lots of things that get in the way of projects getting done, and, and government doesn't control when they get done. It can control when it doesn't get done. Um... Well said. Realtors that are watching the program, and I see dozens of you here on the feed, you better have Green County and your vision for the next handful of years for um, sales, for your, your buyers and potential resale, because that's a hell of a lot of inventory coming on the market. How about some closing thoughts, stuff, tidbits? You know one of my favorite things? We're both sports guys. When we were reading the newspaper in print, I love like the one hitters or the tidbits, like the stuff from the uh, notebook that the reporter couldn't get into the story, but he still wanted to get out to the people. Any tidbits or one-hitters from you? Sure. First and foremost, I want to thank Keith Smith for letting me be here Same. while he's off on the AARP Breaking Away Tour. Um, <laughs> those that don't know the 1979 movie, please go Google it. It's worth it. Um, he will be back Monday, and I'm, the show will be better than I promise. Um, one of the, the one-hitters to, to think about is the uh, AC44 plan. People aren't paying attention to it, and it's huge. Okay. Um, that is the comprehensive plan program that Albemarle County is undertaking. Um, it's kind of in a little bit of a hiatus. It will start back up again. Uh, full disclosure, I serve on work group two of phase one and phase two. Um, they pay me to do this. Wow. Um, yeah, it's like 200 bucks. Okay. Um, I, I didn't want to take the money, and they said, you, you kind of need to. Um, so the... Uh, those meetings will be happening again soon, okay. the pop-ups and the like. This is the plan that talks about how Albemarle County is going to develop. Okay. Pay attention. Okay. Um, when we talk about Green County, this project that's coming forward is smack dab where the comprehensive plan says it should be. Okay. That's why you pay attention to the comprehensive plan process. Um, as we're going into the zoning, keep paying attention to the zoning ordinance. It is a moving document. We will see the final draft, which will be the final draft, um, coming out in the next few weeks. Read it, analyze it, ask questions. Um, I have been very impressed with the consultant team and the staff willingness for me. I went in and said, this setback doesn't say it includes the sidewalk 
you've got to be kidding me. And they said, you know, it doesn't, and it should. That, that's just one of those things that was an oversight, and they didn't say, oh, my God, well, you can't be right. You're Neil Williamson with the Free Enterprise Forum. Everything you say is wrong. Um, they said, okay, let, well, let, let, let's look into that, and we'll make sure that's clearer okay. in the final draft. So I say pay attention to that, and, and remember to support the Free Enterprise Forum. Please go to freeenterpriseforum.wordpress.com. We can't do this without financial support. Click on the donate button. You can click. You can send me a check. There's an address, or you can donate online. But boy, it's July, and I'm not halfway there yet. Free Enterprise Forum guys, support Neil Williamson and his efforts. Please, please, please support Neil Williamson and his efforts. I'm on the website right now. It's right on the menu bar. Donate to the Free Enterprise Forum. Neil, you're a joy, man. It's 11:30, and you've made the show once again um, incredibly easy to host and pleasurable. Many thanks to Judah for keeping us good. Yeah. Judah Wickhauer, thank you. Keith Smith, back Monday. Laura Fawner on the I Love Seville show in one hour to talk about Siren, what's next for Laura, and how a restaurant that she legitimately poured her sweat equity, uh, her family, um, life savings into, closed unexpectedly on Wednesday. Those details and more in one hour on the I Love Seville show. Thank you for joining us and take care.